Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Rupert Koopman, Conservation Manager at the Botanical Society of South Africa. And thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon. Um, we can feel this again, um, autumn is kind of poking around the edges in the Cape after some hot days. And um, we're very happy to be having this conversation around um, Green Planet. But firstly, for uh, there's always new people on the call. Uh, the Botanical Society is a venerable NGO which has been working on plant conservation and assisting the botanical gardens along with our partner Sanby for more than 100 years. And if you're not yet a member, we would like you to consider joining. I'll put some links in the chat. Um, from a housekeeping point of view, we're going to be having our um, speakers back to back. So if you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. And then also we do um, have a live um, Zoom afterwards, the so-called after party, where if you're shy to ask questions um, in this session, we can still hang out and, and catch up around plant issues. So I think why today is, is so spectacular is just the, the fact that um, it, it dovetails very nicely with our last webinar. So uh, we spoke about plant awareness disparity and what that means that that a perception of plants as somehow kind of lesser and less cuddly beings than animals or mean uh, how that means that resources aren't allocated to them and how people think that plants are slightly boring. And um, through uh, the, the green planet, if you've already started seeing it, so it's just started showing in South Africa, um, with the advanced technology, we, we can start seeing what it uh, plants actually do it's just we don't perceive them on the same time scales as, as us. But right now, um, and, and one more thing, um, the, in South Africa, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't speak for anywhere else, but in South Africa, we do have this tendency to not recognize what we've got until it gets international attention. And that's why we're so excited about um, how how the eyes of the world are almost drawn to the flora of South Africa, specifically the Feinbos and the succulent Karoo. And um, right now I'm going to ask Alistair Tones to um, unmute him, sh himself and show his video and just give us a kind of um, behind the scenes view on how he experienced being in a mega diverse country, South Africa, and how um, it was working with the team here. And then after that, we're going to go straight into uh, Joe White's uh, presentation. And then after that, we will be fielding your questions and having a bit of a dialogue. So um, thanks for joining us all the way from the UK, Alistair, and um, making time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Can you hear me OK? Fine. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, cool. So my name is uh, Alistair Tones. I was um, an assistant producer on the Green Planet series. Um, so we filmed for uh, what ended up being almost four years for five um, episodes, which have all been broadcast in the UK now and should hopefully be making their way to South Africa soon. Um, they're all one hour episodes on plants from around the world. Um, but where uh, it's relevant to this talk is we made a seasonal episode. Um, so plants which experience the seasons. And for that, we had the license to uh, pick any plant stories from around the world to kind of investigate um, and film. So uh, whilst we were researching the, the series, we decided that we absolutely had to include um, at least one, if not more, stories from the um, uh, Cape Floral uh, Kingdom. Um, and, you know, we had a very hard time from then on narrowing down exactly what we wanted to film. Um, to give you some kind of background to, to what it, it takes in our decision making process, um, you have to decide, you know, what visually does the plant look like? You know, can you film it and making look interesting for television? Um, second of all, does it have a story? You know, does it have a number of, of, of challenges um, that it goes through, which, uh, you know, can, can create a narrative around it? Um, and also, 
you know, can you actually film those things? So, you know, many plants have extraordinary adaptations for a lot of environments, but can you actually film those in a dynamic way with the equipment that we have available and the time and the money? So this was the kind of lens that we were viewing all of the um, uh, Cape Flora Kingdom with. And, uh, you know, we had all sorts of ideas, but one story which kind of stuck out from the very beginning, which um, was the fire lily, which is the picture um, in the, the background that I've got shared. Um, and we decided that this species was particularly charismatic because, um, you know, not only does it survive a uh, kind of a catastrophic, from the point of view of a plant, natural event in terms of a fire but also rather than just responding in a positive way to fire um which you know many plants um in the fame boss do it it waits for its chance specifically after a fire you know it's only five flowering period is following a fire um it doesn't flower outside of that period and so it's a very specific and very dramatic way to make a living as a, as a living organism. So that was the reason why we wanted to capture this. Um, but of course, when you then decide to go and film something, practically speaking, uh, filming the fire lily was a big challenge for us because you have no idea where it's going to come up by its very nature. You can't dictate where the fire comes up and it, you know, the, the fire that's in the background picture ended up being across kind of hundreds and hundreds of kilometers square. So you don't know where in that landscape it's going to flower. You don't know at what point. So essentially we got in touch with people like Rupert um, and many other botanists and, and all of the other very passionate people that work with plants in South Africa and grilled them. If we're going to film this plant, how do we do it? And they essentially just said, it's simple. You just need to come here six weeks in fire season. You need to be on the ground right in the middle of it. And as soon as a fire comes up, you just go and look around and you search until you find it. So essentially in January of 2019, we headed out for six weeks um, and we had to wait for a fire to come up, which involved a lot of false starts because, you know, uh, some of them, uh, end up going out. Some of them aren't in the right place. Some of them are, uh, you know, four or five hours drive away. So we did a lot of running around looking for a fire. Um, uh, and then in the aftermath, basically waiting for a few days, uh, searching the ground until this flower came up. So that's the kind of first challenge. And the second challenge is once this flower has emerged, it only actually blooms for about 10 days. So you only have that period of time to film with it. Uh, and I think if you've watched any kind of natural history programs, you'll know that we sit around for a hell of a long time, not really doing very much, waiting for things to happen. And so if your flower is only giving you uh, a period of 10 days in which to film all of your material, then it's, it's really quite stressful because we wanted to see the flower being pollinated. Um, and from our experience, they're just not visited that often. So we were often sat around waiting, you know, wondering whether we're going to get a butterfly, a bird, are we in the wrong place? Is it going to get visited at all? Um, and then in the aftermath of it, we also wanted to film the regreening of the landscape. So we returned for another month, uh, 10 months later to the same hillside and filmed all of the re-sprouting boss around where we'd filmed our fire lily. And so in the film, this makes a, you know, a whole story from exploring the, the incredible diversity of the, the fame boss, realizing that this one plant has this incredible strategy to give itself an edge. And then in the aftermath, you know, we realize that this landscape is completely built to withstand fire and respond to it. Um, and I had a fantastic time filming the flower, uh, and I hope it was a, a great example um, for everything that's great about the fame boss species. Um, and of course, we filmed some other ones. We filmed Ceratocarium, which Joe's going to talk about. Um, Stapelia also appears in the series, um, and those shoots also had their challenges as well. Um, but yeah, I suppose, Rupert, if you want to ask me any questions about, you know, the filming process, that's probably the easiest, easiest thing to do. 
Sure. I'm going to ask you one or two before we go to Joe. Um, thanks for that overview. And some of you might have tuned in wanting to see footage. And unfortunately, because the show is already on air at this moment in time, uh, for copyright reasons, we, we won't be doing that. Um, so you'll just have to go and watch it at, at your various places. But it is now showing in South Africa. So um, yeah, keep, your, keep yourselves <laughs> open to that. Um, I'm just checking if I'm pinned myself. Um, right. So I think um, I, I almost want to contextualize your kind of international experience, Alistair, mm. and, and be, you know, firstly, compared to other hotspots um, that you, you've filled in just for the series, and I mean, you've been doing it for, for quite a while. How, how did that experience translate here? Um, because I always think just from watching these documentaries that, um, you know, compared to the rainforest, South Africa is pretty easy to, <laughs> to, to, to get to this place because we've got really good information and the roads are okay and you're not going to get malaria <laughs> while shooting. Um, yeah, but maybe just uh, broaden out on, on that, how, how you found the, the country experience versus, versus other um, places that you shot. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, you know, from a, from a story point of view, we we really loved that the the fame boss was an example of how um competition between plants drives diversity so that was that was one of the major things that we we wanted to explore but it's amazing you know on the on the cape peninsula it's in such a small area and all of these mountain sides exist within the conurbations uh like cape town and everything else that springs around to it so you can just go and visit these hillsides amazing reserves you know with incredible floral diversity with a really good infrastructure uh and so it was really easy to get your teeth into you know all of the gems that uh live within that landscape and the other thing that i found which i don't think you necessarily get everywhere else was you know you mentioned it yourself rupert that you know botany is sometimes it's not you know it's not a very rock star profession to many uh, and so sometimes when we talk to researchers and, and scientists and experts in different countries about plants, we're dealing with a relatively small pool of people who know what they're talking about. But in South Africa, I think I can scroll through my phone and I've got maybe 50 or 60 contacts, all of whom I could just send a WhatsApp to who would, A, they would know which species we were talking about and where we might find them and the, you know, the different challenges we might have in filming them but also just so incredibly enthusiastic about the plants that they had on their back doors. You know, there's just a really good community of, of not just botanists, but people involved in the subject and who have a passion for it. And in fact, the, the mountainside that's in the picture um, on my background is the Grayton mountainside. And in Grayton, there isn't really any, you know, resident experts or naturalists, but in just arriving uh into the the kind of the the edge of the village and looking at the the burnt hillside in the aftermath of the fire we got speaking to a lady and she said oh you know i'm a member of the naturalist society i'll put you in touch with my friend andrew so i got andrew's whatsapp number i whatsapped andrew he came riding down on his bike and he said oh yeah we, we've got a little whatsapp group and a facebook page we'll just say what you're here and what you're looking for and then over the next few days, people were sending me messages saying, oh, I've seen this flower. Is this what you're looking for? You know, I can go out next morning. I can go for a hike and I'll let you know after the weekend. Um, and then even nine months later, when everything was regreening and we were planning to come back, I was messaging the same people. And they said, yeah, you know, how's it? You know, how's it, Alistair? How's it going? We remember you. What can I do to help you? So it just had this really nice community spirit for you know people that were passionate about the fame boss um and i don't think we found that uh in a lot of other places really uh and i think it must be something to do with you know what you guys have is extraordinarily special but it's also it's in relatively small pockets in comparison to other places uh and the environments change over such a small area as well that you know you just you've got so much interest on your back doorsteps so i think that was fascinating um and obviously the food's great um uh, the people are great uh, and so yeah we had a fantastic time staying in Grayton for six weeks you know we couldn't have asked for anything better one of our colleagues was a vegan 
And he was able to go down to his vegan coffee shop and get a vegan brownie and then head out filming, which, you know, you don't get everywhere we go. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it was quite unique. Um, and also just in terms of the floral diversity, I think we only really got the same kind of feeling from Australia. And obviously the two kingdoms are, you know, linked in some way if we go back a long, a long way. So, uh, I, yeah, it was a very special experience for me and unlike any of the other filming that we did. Awesome, thanks. And and I mean, I'm I'm so glad you talk about this kind of community that we do have, because you know building that community doesn't come by chance. It's um, you know we're building on centuries worth of botanical exploration, not just by you know your classical kind of um, person from Europe coming to collect stuff, but from local people. There's traditional knowledge, mm-hmm. um, all of that kind of interfuse and that's why uh, we do what we do at, at Botsock is just to try and bring all these people together even more so um, it's good to have a, a rubber stamp from there uh, one more question because this is the one that everyone wants to know is like at which stage in the process does Attenborough show up <laughs> <laughs> well so uh, I guess there's a few ways to skin that cat you don't get a series like Green Planet green lit uh without him being on board so i don't think a series like this gets made you know without him being the voice of it because you know even if you're slightly uh skeptical about how interesting plants are you know if if david amber says they're interesting then you're you're going to listen so he's he was on board from the very start then uh, we as a as a team we go and find the stories we go and film them and he has been kind of generally kept up to date but he actually has this really nice moment because he came these days he comes mainly in for the the scripting period of the the filming when he you he kind of has this childlike joy at seeing everything that we've filmed and the fact that he can now you like tackle the scripts and talk about it and bring his own polish to it all towards the end of it um so so it's he kind of bookends the whole process these days but green planet was unusual because um he actually pops up throughout the episode more than he has done in previous series um so we took him on location to california to finland costa rica and so you know it was fantastic having him involved um on location in a way that you know not many series um, have and the only reason he's doing that is because he himself is a passionate um, uh, botanist and plant lover um, but also when he's talking next to a plant he really just brings an extra level of uh, of authority to the you know the subjects which so we were very lucky to have that with him to be honest yeah and we really appreciate it because it, it gives that kind of heft you know um that is international recognition and, you know, people listen when Attenborough talk. Mm. And so now for us to be able to tag into that and do this sort of thing and, and all the other follow-up um, activities that we're planning around Green Planet is, is just spectacular to be able to, to do that. So um, just thank you to him <laughs> in his absence. So carry it over. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay. So, uh, Ali, if you could switch your, your camera and mic off, um, we're going to go to Joe White um, and uh, hear about what's happening on the ground with um, the filming of Serata Kerm. And also, uh, Joe, you can put your camera and, and mic on. Um, so uh, Dr. Joseph White is um, a, 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 well, what did you call it? A pollination biologist, a... a um, a plant animal interaction expert. And first we spoke when um, he was doing work in the Cedarburg um, on, on the Cedars, which was in the recent Felton, Florida. So you need to go and read that article. But um, this is just one of the other interesting interactions. And Joe, we're going to have to get you back to talk about the, the rock mice and the hairy argentia at a different time, because that's also a fascinating mutualism. But um, the 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 good the cool thing is I'm not going to steal his thunder. Is that um, Joe put this uh, this interaction online a while ago, and and it was part of you know putting out this information that drew the team's attention to this mutualism, and it's a fascinating one. I'm not going to uh, go into much more detail, but I definitely when I do Feinbus talks, I always use this as an example of a really interesting uh, mutualism. 
So uh, go ahead, Joe, and, and uh, tell us about the stinky seeds. Thank you, Rupert. Um, yeah, and just for maybe for future uh, seminars, we can go through one by one all the seeds we have here. So these are the different seeds that I've, I've had, the, had the pleasure of being able to look at over the last uh, few years of my uh, postgrad research. But today we're going to be talking about one in particular, um, sowing seeds, uh, sowing stories with uh, stinky seeds. And firstly, thank you, Alistair, for the interesting background on the filming. So I'm going to give a bit more background on some of the uh, research into Ceratocarium magentium, the plant that was filmed in the Green Planet series. Um, and then as, uh, I'll follow that up with a bit of my experience um, as a kind of uh, logistics person, as well as scientific uh, kind of um, advisor to the Green Planet team. So just a bit of background on seeds and fainbos in general. Uh, there are two major pressures that, that seeds experience in the system, and those mostly come from the, the regular fires that come through every 10 to 20 years. And the other one comes from uh, seeds being eaten by a bunch of the different small mammals that are in the system. So plants have to try and find a way to adapt and try and solve this problem of these two major pressures. And some of the major strategies that they, um, that they end up going through are to try and either avoid uh, the fire by, by getting into the canopy and protecting the woody cones. This is typical of what we see with proteas and uh, some of the leucodendron. And this is a very good way to one, protect from fire, but also to try and protect themselves from uh, rodents on the, uh, on the ground, which can't uh, easily access these, these tough woody cones. And then some of the uh, very common strategies are uh, mimicacory or dispersal by ants, where seeds manage to get themselves into the seed soil bank. And what I mostly focused on for my research was looking at uh, small mammals and how plants can actually bribe them into uh, dispersing their seeds. So inevitably, uh, when the plants produce these big nuts, a bunch of them will be eaten by the rodents. Uh, but then for a few species, they'll end up scatter hoarding them. So they move them around the landscape, um, bury them, try and come back to get them later, but inevitably forget about a few. So the scatter hoarding paradigm is kind of what we went into when we um, decided to start researching Ceratocarium argentium, which is probably the biggest nut uh, that's produced in Fenbos. It's a beautiful, uh, large seed, probably about uh, a centimeter each direction, uh, which occurs in the kind of Overberg region uh, of the Southwestern Cape. And we, we, we thought the seed was absolutely primed to be dispersed by rodents. So that's kind of where we started off with, with our understanding of the system. It's a beautiful resto, it's in the resto Macy family. Uh, these restos grow about like two meters tall and the seeds drop um, in, in January uh, every single year. So we went off to the Herb Nature Reserve um, in about 2013 is where the story starts to try and understand this um, kind of the dispersal of the seed and how it might be interacting with small mammals. And first shout out to my collaborators on this project. Um, my two supervisors at the time were Jeremy Midgley and Gary Brunner. And then we also had invaluable help from uh, Steve Johnson in this research. So we, we did what we typically do, which is go and place uh, a bunch of seeds out and uh, place camera traps over them to try and observe what's going on. And we placed down some leucodendron seeds, which we know are typically scatter hoarded and rodents love interacting with these seeds, as well as a bunch of the ceratocarium seeds. And what we found, uh, we expected to see these leucodendrons taken and they're pretty much always removed from the sites that they put them at. And basically all those seeds were, were typically uh, eaten and the, the rodents love interacting with these seeds. With Ceratocarium, on the other hand, we had a completely different story. The rodents really just weren't interested in the seeds. Occasionally, they'd be removed from the sites, but not once did we see a rodent um, actually consume one of these seeds, which was really strange. We were kind of stumped at this point. Um, I kind of wasted a year of, of postgraduate research trying to, trying to uh, get to the bottom of this and couldn't necessarily work it out. Uh, but we, we managed to crack um, a bit of luck at one point where, actually, we're not quite there to, to the <laughs> break yet. So we, we, tried, we tried to um, see if the rodents actually enjoyed these seeds uh, with the, the seed coat taken off. So as you can see in the top left corner, uh, the seeds have this really thick seed coat. What you can see is that this rodent is, is trying to have a level on the seed with the, the seed coat still on. And then it goes ahead and starts eating the ones that we've removed. So, it seems like the rodents are quite happy to eat the, the very nutritious uh, endosperm of the seeds, but they can't get through that really thick seed coat. So it seems like these seeds have worked out a way to protect themselves from rodents. Um, so the next point then is trying to get uh, work out how they get into the soil bank. And 
in this case, uh, we were really lucky to try and get a bit more information on this where we eventually worked this out. This is just a lovely coincidental video of a, a rodent again trying to break into um, one of the seeds and really struggling, taking a long time. And if you see in the top left corner, one of the seeds slowly starts to roll away. And this kind of, this eventually caught our attention. We we're kind of lucky to, to observe this on the cameras. Uh, this is the, the kind of camera trap footage that we have. And if I just plays again, you'll see just over here in the kind of left of the rodent, one of the seeds starts rolling away. And what we worked out was that a dung beetle uh, was interacting with these seeds. Uh, so this was just a major complete break of uh, what we were expecting at the time. This is Epirinus uh, flagellatus, a very small uh, dung beetle, which is found, uh, found in the Cape. And the, seed was, the seeds were being moved, rolled, and buried by these dung beetles. And this was really fascinating, and we, we had to try and get to the bottom of this. So what we quickly clicked onto is that um, these seeds are very similar in appearance to some of the local antelope droppings. So this is a Pontebok and Pontebok dropping together with the seed. They have a really strong resemblance. And uh, this Pontebok, interestingly, is, is pretty much Overberg endemic. It's only found in the Overberg region of South Africa. And its distribution pretty much perfectly matches up with the Stratocarium seeds. So it, it clearly matches the appearance very well, but we wanted to get a bit more understanding of uh, kind of the chemical profile of the seeds because Dung beetles don't typically use their eyes when they're moving around. They're, they're, they're kind of um, scent orientated beings. They're, they're far more interested in the way things smell. And uh, with the help of uh, Professor Steve Johnson from UKZN, uh, he did this brilliant analysis on uh, the scent profile of the seeds, as well as different uh, various herbivore dung, as well as some other residues, just to try and compare the different plants. And what he found was that uh, the stratocarium seeds produce an almost identical scent profile, a very, very similar scent profile. So that's all the scents that are being kind of released and the chemical volatiles that have been released by these seeds matches up incredibly well with a bunch of different herbivore dunks. These herbivores include the Bontebok, Ilant, um, I think we had elephant in there as well, as well as uh, ostrich. And there's a really, really close match. So essentially the seed would fit right into the middle there, uh, whereas rest your seeds fall quite far away from this kind of tight grouping of, of, of smells. This is kind of a similarity plot to show how similar they are to one another. So Ceratocarium is rather different to different, seed, the different seeds in the family, but it gives off an incredibly similar smell. It's mimicking the scent of different types of feces. And then on top of that, it's also very smelly. So it's not just that it uh, smells similar, it's that it's actively emitting a lot of scent. Um, so if you, the, the axis on the, on, the, um, on the left side there is the, the rate at which the scent is emitted from the seed compared to uh, point to droppings or again the other rest of seeds and sometimes the, the stratocarium seeds could be emitting more scent than droppings even the old seeds managed to emit quite, a, emit quite a bit of scent and we think this is largely due to the kind of the tuberculation or the, the little hills and valleys of of the seed you can see it has lots of little dimples on it which really helps to try to increase the surface area and probably gives more surface area uh, for scent to be emitted whereas other rest of seeds that are typically dispersed by ants like the canamoyas um, was, was barely emitting any scent in comparison to uh, the ceratocarium seeds. So this allowed us to kind of properly conceptualize this relationship, that the dung beetles here have been completely fooled. They typically rely on the dung as a food source. Uh, so they would typically roll and bury uh, dung pellets um, and put them on the ground, either for them to eat at the time or um, to lay eggs in for their larvae. Uh, and what was happening here was that the seeds uh, had this, uh, coined this term, fecal mimicry. So they were mimicking the feces to try and take advantage of these dung beetles. And essentially this dung beetle is being completely deceived. There's no benefit in this interaction whatsoever to the dung beetles. So there's a bit of a cost involved. Luckily the seeds only drop at a very short period of the year. So it's not like an extended cost, but it is, it is a cost to them um, for that short period of time. But the seed gets enormous benefit for being buried on the ground and being safe from fire. So here's a bit of a video. I hope you can see this clearly and it's not too laggy on your side. Uh, but it's a bit of a video that I put together um, shortly after we started doing our research and shared on YouTube. And it's just a, it's a very nice uh, kind of run through. And, so it's not nearly as good as what you've seen in green panels, so it's a really good one to go ahead and watch the green panels, so it's absolutely magnificent. Um, 
And as you can see, so this is the small dung beetle, Epirinus uh, flagellatus, and it tends to roll and bury these seeds uh, one at a time. It's a relatively small rodent, um, mm -hmm. relatively small dung beetle rather, and it uh, rolls them one at a time and buries them kind of in this Goldilocks zone. So it buries them about one to two centimeters deep, which is uh, just deep enough uh, to be uh, protected from the fires that are coming through. So that was the first species that we ended up uh, noticing. And uh, while spending more time out in the field, we, we came across this other species called uh, Scarabaeus screechus. It's somewhat bigger than the Epirinus. You can see them both together in the shot. And the Scarabaeus was absolutely muggy, like completely, completely blown away by the seeds. The, the scent of, of the, the seeds is clearly very overwhelming for this individual. And it, it tends to do a slightly different interaction to uh, the Epirinus, the smaller one. It tends to bury these seeds all together in one go. So there's obviously a slightly different ecological value to the species, but if it were to find one seed at a time, it would typically bury them one at a time. Um, but this is the species Scarabaeus that you'll see in um, the Green Planet episode. So it's a, it was the star of the show there, and it's a really it's a beautiful dung beetle, and um, is a really has a really good interaction and really positive outcome um, for the seeds. But again, uh, this is all at the cost of the dung beetle. All this energy and excitement is basically for nothing, and we expect that the Dung beetles only find out about the deception um, after they've uh, buried these seeds. So once they try and um, either lay an egg or try and consume consume the seed, is likely when they they figured out that they've been deceived in this case. So that's that's kind of the background to the research, um, and then we can move on to uh, aspects of the filming. So. Sorry, I just put my video back on there. Um, so we can move on to aspects of the filming. So uh, this is an email, kind of the head of the email that got sent to Jeremy Midgley, my advisor at the time, um, from Lance Featherstone. So Lance was the researcher on the story and got in touch with Jeremy. And Jeremy very graciously forwarded this on to me and said, hey, Joe, I think there's something that you'll be interested in. And as soon as I saw the headline, I was like absolutely blown away by this. I was so excited that we'd have the opportunity to try and, um, as Rupert was saying, try and try and show this to an international audience, which unfortunately is a way for more South Africans to recognize it too. It's kind of hard to necessarily get uh, a plant story out there, but having a series with uh, BBC Green Planet following on from a lot of the other really big feature uh, feature series they've had and narrated by David Attenborough is always an amazing opportunity. So I jumped at the chance, uh, got in touch with, with Lance, uh, and we had some uh, conversations about logistics and how we're going to make this work from kind of uh, July 2018. And eventually we got into the field. Uh, we got into the field in about December 2019 and Jan 2020. And I was together with Lance as well as um, the camera operator, John Brown. And we headed off to the Herb. So you kind of drive through these agricultural landscapes and eventually you get through to the Herb, which is this absolutely beautiful reserve uh, on, on the south coast, close to the Darsdorf. And close to the Potberg region in De Hope is this really beautiful, really beautiful landscape, which has this amazing mosaic of different soil types. So it has these limestones uh, on, on kind of the left-hand side here. It has fairy creeks on the back, which have largely been farmed now, unfortunately. And then uh, the Potberg sandstone mountain. And in between these two, the limestones and the sandstones, you get these uh, somewhat deeper sands. And this seems to be the perfect space for stratocarians to grow, as it also provides um, Kind of a soil that's a good texture for dung beetles to be able to, to dig in. That seems to be like a like fairly consistent across where you find stratocarium. It's always in these somewhat sandier soils. And this is also the site that we used for um, for filming. And the tricky thing with, with filming, um, as Alistair was saying, is that sometimes uh, you can't really predict when things are going to happen and how it's going to work out. So uh, this is kind of the, the, the temperature profile and rainfall profile for um, the Hope and the greater Oakberg area. Um, there tends to be rainfall pretty much throughout the year. There's a bit of a peak in winter, but you get rainfall pretty much throughout the year. And temperatures tend to peak around December, January. So we're there in December, January. And this is the perfect time because the, the seeds are falling off the plants um, around this time. And it's also nice and warm for dung beetles to be active. However, you still get these days where the weather doesn't quite play along. So for the first, uh, the first three or so days, my, the plan is always for me to go and join this team for about three days and try and kick them off, get them started. And uh, once everything is set up, they'll be able to film in peace for a while. Unfortunately, as soon as we get there, there's a ton of rain. 
the next day it's really hot. The weather just wasn't playing along. So we ended up having to be really patient. I ended up leaving the team, not sure how they were going to do. Um, the weather just wasn't playing along. It was raining, really terrible conditions for trying to film um, dung beetles and interactions. So we were, fortunately, um, I came back um, a few days later for just a day to make sure everything was okay. Managed to try and get some uh, pitfall traps from the crazy stuff on swelling dung, uh, where you try and just add a little bit of bait to a cup and you, you put it on the ground and hope dung beetles will come through. Uh, but eventually, the, the team managed to, to get some really great shots of the dung beetles interacting with the seeds. And it's, there's always a bit of pressure when you have uh, this, this international filming crew coming from the UK uh, to try and observe something that to tell them, yes, this is the best time of year. Uh, this is, it's, it's going to work out. Uh, let's just make sure we have enough time. And as the days start to come by, you start to get more and more nervous that uh, this interaction isn't going to work out and they're not going to be able to film it. Um, but, but fortunately, Lance and, and John managed to uh, put it together brilliantly. And I've been fortunate enough to see a bit of the clip and it's, it's really just like expertly done. Really brilliant, uh, brilliant filming and gives a chance for this interaction to, to be shown to a much, much larger audience uh, through South Africa and, and throughout the world. And yeah, it's, it's really just brilliant. Uh, some of the, the, the tools and techniques, I think Alice can speak to this a bit, a bit better um, when we get back to the Q&A. You really get to see the footage from the dung beetles perspective. They have these excellent lenses and I think it's called the probe, which is this really long lens, very small, long lens, uh, which can really, this is footage that, that I have, we can't show the Green Palace up yet, so definitely tune in. I think it's on Sunday where you can watch it, but you'll get to see these amazing shots that look like it's a dung beetle moving around. It's really brilliant from the dung beetles perspective. And then also the, the episode really does uh, focus brilliantly on the, on the fire lily as well. And it must have been really hard to try and um, coordinate the filming of that, as Alistair was saying. And nature is sometimes unpredictable, and these things don't always work out. But with a bit of patience, you can put together a good story. And I'd just like to end off here with, um, if, you, if you get to watch the Green Pirate episodes, you'll see that there's always a bit of a reality dose uh, at the end of each one, where, where the tone kind of changes for a second. And um, you see these beautiful interactions, and you see these amazing, uh, amazing places. And they tend to end with just a bit of a, a bit of a dose of reality, not too much, not to completely um, put you off, but uh, like enough to just make you realize, hang on, the world's actually in a tricky place at the moment, uh, especially in terms of habitat and plants um, and, and keeping um, our biodiversity intact. So this is a story, Ceratocarium Argentium at least, is a relatively widespread species. It's because um, relatively in, in quite a few places across the Overberg, but the sister species, Ceratocarium pulchrum, is one that we started studying around the time that we we're doing the filming for Green Planet and a bit after that. And we managed to find that the species is uh, dispersed in a very similar way to Ceratocarium argentium. It's a much smaller stature species. You can see argentium in the back there, much taller. And this one's a very short statured one. And so it, it tends to be, it seems to be dispersed in exactly the same way by dung beetles, um, but has a slightly different phenology where the seeds drop at a different time of year, which is probably how the two species came about. Um, but this species is also under threat. So I just want to add a note here. There are about 50, 50 of these individuals left. They occur in the Overberg. As you can see in the photo, this photo on the bottom right, there are about, um, about 20 or so individuals there stuck within the Leucodendron, Platyspermum, cut flower plantation, with pine trees invading in the back. So just a, a reminder and message uh, that Batsak and uh, all the other different uh, kind of plant biodiversity organizations are doing a great job of trying to raise plant awareness. Uh, keep track of these, these really narrow endemic uh, populations of plants. And if we want to keep telling these stories of these brilliant interactions, um, hopefully we'll be able to keep these, keep these going to be able to show more and, 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 tr and try and uh, tell more stories from uh, South Africa's amazing biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joseph. Um, I'm going to ask Ali to also put his camera on we can just uh, round table a little, little bit there's no active um, questions in the chat so uh, people out there you do have another kind of 10 15 minutes if you want to do find out about what's going on um, and I just wanted to say uh, when when I spoke to um, or when I saw this this clip uh, that you're talking about Joseph as well just like you know it's got that beautiful BBC score. It's got David Attenborough pronouncing Feinbos properly. Um, <laughs> you know, all, all that 
beautiful attention to detail is really amazing because i mean you know we've all had that, that experience where people come in and then the work hasn't been done as well and then you're like oh man you know it's almost like those those big blockbuster movies where they get the south african accent wrong um you know it's like it just leaves you in in a weird space and and i've i've from the little i've seen um, so I'm waiting for this for Sunday as well. It, there's there's nothing for us to worry about, and it's something we can like proudly go and get people to to go and look at. So um, yeah, I'm looking at at the the Q and A's. There's not anything beyond like where it's showing and so forth. And I'm not going to mention the channels because you know the, uh, we're not getting paid for advertising. Um, but uh, I, I will in, I'll enter it into the chat. But um, in this interaction. Uh, Alistair, is there something you wanted to ask Joe about his experience or, or ask us about, you know, how we're going to take some of this work forward? Um, Joe, I'm very glad that you brought in Ceratocarium Pulcrum. Um, I, I dropped a link to it also in the chat to the Red List uh, status because it's ex uh, that's almost one of the big issues that we want to use this focus of attention is that, as Alistair says, globally, the fan boss is unusual in having all these like really small species um, and, and uh, the work with crew, the custodians of rare endangered wildflowers is um, that we've got hundreds literally of species that are found with a home range of smaller than 10 square kilometers, not all of them in our current protected area um, network, so the nature reserve and national parks. And how do we get out there and monitor them all. <laughs> and then monitoring is the first thing, is like the second thing is doing something about it. And the Serato Karen Pulcrum, that rest there is a really good example where it's right next to the road. Um, it's a place where there's active uh, Fainbos flower farming, farming happening. And all you need is for someone to be like a little bit on a, a, on a bad day with the tractor and we lose like 20% of, of the global species. And it's one of those things that's not yet, as far as I know, in exit you a cultivation um so i will i will i will flag something at the end in terms of what botsock members can actually do about this sort of thing but you know starting with from that as a as a springboard to this conversation um maybe alistair if, if you've had some kind of international mm. experience and then joe more from the kind of research side and and what i really like is the fact that you know through these conversations we are bringing the research to the people and then getting to the point of saying, you know, how can we um, use the power of the BOTSOC network to get people out there and observing? And I'll talk about citizen science and at, as we go out. So start, mm -hmm. Alistair, and then we'll go from there. Well, Joseph, I was just, I was interested, you brought the slide up of Lance's um, email. You know, uh, Lance is obviously a guy I work with, um, you know, mostly see him down the pub to chat to and occasionally see him in work. But like I, it's you know when we're looking for these stories, um, we're doing a lot of reading of papers and articles and all that kind of thing. And you know you can, you can just kind of smell when there might be a story in a scientific paper. But I, we never really find out how did it feel for you when you got the email? Because obviously, if I'm e emailing you, I don't consider it a particularly big deal for me to be emailing. But I, I think that sometimes. And Rupert, you mentioned, you know, things like pronunciations. We sometimes don't appreciate how important this, this stuff is to get right. And, you know, we, we do need to always remember that this, these are subjects which people are extraordinarily passionate about. You know, as, as filmmakers who work internationally, you're kind of in a privileged position because you get to, you get to travel. And then when you film the show, everyone talks to you about, you know, how great it was if they enjoyed it. But really, it's not often that the conversation comes back to the people who look after it on a day to day basis. You know, after Green Planet goes on air, all of you guys working in conservation for um, plant diversity go about that job on a day to day basis. And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, the gloss is is shown with the program, but really the hard work is done by, you know, by you guys. And I just, yeah, it's interesting to know how you felt when you saw that email come through. Is it, is it a payoff for your, for your work? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, it, it's always a bit exciting uh, getting the opportunity to show your research on a, bigger, um, on a bigger scale. And especially coming from the BBC where you get the feeling like it should do it some justice. Um, but the conversations with, with Lance were great. And like you said, it, it, it actually felt like he was very invested in the story. 
Mm. He'd read through the papers carefully. He was questioning me on small details, um, both just, I think, out of curiosity as well as um, logistics of how to actually, uh, how to actually film it. Um, so yeah, and it's and it's a really fun detour from your kind of like day to day research as well, you know. So it's uh, mm-hmm. getting the chance to go to the field and show it to other people is always really exciting, uh, no matter who it is, whether it's uh, students or filmmakers or um, or and things like crew when you find come across a cool plant. But yeah, getting the chance to show up to go to carry um, is fantastic, and it's it's yeah, it was just a great opportunity to work uh, work with you guys and. Yeah, I think I I just love the idea of getting a better audience. I think that's the that was the mm-hmm. big thing for me. I, I made that video and added it to YouTube about six years ago, and it's it's got a little bit of traction, but it's not going to get vaguely near the same viewership that uh, I could possibly get on on a big broadcasting company. So it's yeah, mm-hmm. it's really cool. But it, even so, I feel like it's still hard if you haven't got an appreciation for you know how amazing it is that a plant has evolved to match the same scent as a dung as a piece of dung which it has yeah. no genetic relationship to whatsoever like it's just i hope that these kind of programs they go some way into showing how amazing that is but they don't go the whole way you know and you you really have to invest people in plants and then hopefully they can open up this world into you know all of these incredible relationships and also the timing of things you know the phenology of of when plants appear in line with insects, you know, whether they're emergence or breeding or whatever is so, so fine that it's, it's really difficult to get across that across in these shows uh, because, you know, you don't have all that long to explore these themes. Yeah. So um, I hope we do a good job, but I, I think hopefully it just opens the door for people who have an interest to find out more because we didn't scratch the surface really with what we covered. Yeah, there's too much cool stuff to show, right? There's, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine yeah. the challenge of you guys sitting there trying to trying to work out exactly what to fit in. Um, but yeah, I think I mean almost certainly similar to the the um, hammer wasp story, which is another one. It's mm. really the, the hammer orchid rather and wasp yeah. interaction. It's the the timing with to get insects that are um, seasonally active together with uh, seeds that only drop over a short period of time is difficult, and we it, it, it's definitely a reason we we took years to find this interaction after going to the same site. It's the site that we use for, um, for third year students, a field camp that we go on every year. Um, yet it took years to get to this point because you kind of just had to get that perfect timing. And it, it, I think it's always tricky when you, especially when I was having conversations with, with Lance uh, right at the beginning, it's, I, I try and turn down the, the likelihood of, of being able to get it on the first go, you know, on the first day. Because uh, you're never quite sure if things are going to work out, and um, I think I think any time you, you get to see it or it gets to work out, you're relatively lucky. Um, so I'm 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 yeah. glad that it that it got featured at least. I was worried for some time. I was like, this might not actually make it in if, if it wasn't good enough footage. But I'm I'm glad they managed. Yeah. To, so to so it. that definitely happened with with the actual fire stuff because we were like, hey, no problem. You know, it's peak fire season in the Cape. You you, you guys <laughs> will be fine. And then for the six weeks that they had budgeted, um, there were no fires, unusually. And as soon as they left, then there were these massive fires all over the place. And and that just indicates again, you know, the the kind of variability in nature that that we all have to live with. Um, it's just on a different time scale. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, I'm going to go to a couple of questions. Uh, Joe, there's one from Ruth in uh, KZN. Um, and she asked also, do, uh, do you think that the seed coat texture has any relevance for the beetles or the sentence uh, shape size only? And is that texture similar or different from relatives? That's a cool question, Ruth. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I, I'd imagine there is some, um, some importance to the, the kind of tuberculation grooves of the seeds as well, because a, a really smooth object Something like a marble would probably be a bit tricky for a dung beetle to to roll, and um, some of the the other species in the genus are much smoother. They don't have that um, that same kind of rough texture that the uh, Ceratogarum argentium or Pulchrum have. So I, I imagine there probably is an aspect to getting a bit of the texture. Uh, our initial thinking of it was that it, it adds a lot more surface area for scent to be emitted, but 
I think that's a really good point. I think almost certainly it would help with um, a bit of like tactile functioning with, between the dung beetles. So yeah, I think that's, I think you're onto something with, yeah, definitely. Yeah. The super grippy restio seed yeah. for peak performance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, there's basically th uh, three questions in one, which I'll answer if you guys don't mind from Yolanda Kirsten. Um, so are there programs that actively try to propagate these species? And the second part is, do you, you don't think that shows like that these might get the collectors that aren't conservationists focus on going after these species? Um, and are we creating more risk to them? So that, those are all valid. So firstly, um, we've got a fantastic network of botanical gardens in, in South Africa, um, mostly national botanical gardens under the South African National Biodiversity Institute. But, um, you know, we've, all, we've got more species than what we can handle. That's the short answer. So there are programs like the Millennium Seed Bank Project, which is uh, basically out of queue, but there are local staff uh, employed by Sanby to go out and just collect seed um, of threatened species. Then it's about growing them. And then the other thing is growing a conservation grade collection. So growing a conservation grade collection is not just four or five plants in a bed at Kirstenbosch. It's actually having a collection of sufficient kind of um, variety to, to replicate a wild population. Um, and, and there's many kind of rules of thumb, but one I remember from a while ago is basically you want at least 30 individuals of 50 different origins. So whether that's cuttings or seeds, and that's why seeds are actually great because, you know, you get with Erica's, you can store, um, you know, thousands of individuals genetically in like a little uh, pot like this. Now, when you get to things like uh, the restio seed, which might need something different, there's no dung beetles in queue <laughs> that operate like that. So you need to figure out what are the germination queues. Um, and, and that's what we're doing all the time. Um, you know, there's a long list and we chip away at the list and some things like the fire lily are from um, families where you don't have seeds that can be stored. So those seeds germinate as soon as, um, as it gets moist and cool in autumn. Uh, so there's a different strategy out there. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a process that we're all uh, in on and uh, we, there's a network of people across the world who love South African plants who are working on these. So one of the technical uh, people that was involved and we'll probably get him on for the future is Robbie Blackhall Miles. Um, who's, who's a kind of Gondwana feinbos nut from, from Wales. And he's busy growing a spatella there, which has not ever been germinated in South Africa, you know. Uh, and, and this is the kind of uh, approach we're going to have because we just don't have the space in the current botanical gardens and, um, and the manpower to do it for all the species. So it will have to be a global collaborative effect. Mm -hmm. And then as, as to your, your next uh, point uh, about the, um, the risk to these species, well, luckily at this moment in time, restios aren't that um, <laughs> collectible, um, but uh, we, we've had uh, webinars about the succulent crisis and so forth. And, and um, you know, in pushing the citizen science, which I'll do in a minute, they are, they have been um, kind of, uh, rejigging of platforms like iNaturalist so that the records for the highly sensitive species are obscured so that you can't go directly to it. Only the trusted people like Crew and Sandy can extract that sort of data to, to use. Because um, in the past, these, these platforms have actually been used by collectors to, to go to sites. So um, it's, it's a definite threat, but um, we also can't hide everything. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a balance, you know, because plants tell cool stories and we need those cool stories to get the support. Sure. So, um, Alistair, uh, do you want to ask me or Joe anything else? Well, I, was, I, was just, I was just thinking, actually, when you were speaking, Rupert, the, the uh, you know, whether exposure of these plants encourages its um, piracy from the wild. And I think, you know, that's a really valid point. I do think, however, we we covered two stories in Hawaii, which, you know, has an incredible problem with its endemic species and them going, um, you know, going extinct. And they, they have a group there um, whose sole purpose is to save plant species with less than 50 individuals in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, 
But through their work, some of those species that they've saved are now very safe in cultivation, mainly in Europe and not in Hawaii and on, you know, in the horticultural market. So I'd, I think there's a really interesting balance to be had for, you know, encouraging people's um, enjoyment of these plants where they can, you know, in their own environment, but also, you know, doing that in a very sustainable way. And, you know, working with the seed bank, it was very apparent as well that that's kind of, it's not really a magic bullet. It's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a last act of desperation for some plants. You know, the first and foremost should be to have a living um, collection of these plants that are secured. Um, so I just, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question about how exposure uh, can generate a positive action for plants that are in trouble, you know, rather than encourage, you know, a black market for things that are rare, which ends up in the destruction of the species. Um, but it was funny, we, you know, a lot of this, the filming that we do for Green Planet is, is in a studio. So if you want to film a plant in time lapse, often uh, if you film it in the wild, any gust of wind is going to take your plant out of the frame. And so your time lapse shot ends up just looking like this, it goes crazy. So where possible, we have studio filming. So of course we wanted to try and get a fire lily bulb into the studio uh, to film. So normally you would just chat to experts and say, you know, are these in cultivation? And you would hope to, to find a specimen, but basically because the fire lily only responds to and germinates to smoke, then basically no collectors want the plant because you keep, you would have to keep burning piles of hay on your flower beds every season just to get 10 days of flowers from them. And so they, they don't really exist in cultivation at all or in collections at all. So we basically had months and months and months of talking to Cape Nature and sand parks, trying to target a fire. And then I know watching as a, a lady called Tessa Oliver, who was working with working on fire at the time, but was a, kind of an expert plant wrangler for us, who was just basically busying herself going out to the, to the fire sites to try and find a specimen for us to find and film in the studio and it was months and months and months until we could find any specimen that we could we could try and film um so when you see it on television and you see a kind of a four second shot of a, the you know the the flower growing the amount of work it sometimes takes just to get that is is astronomical uh and sometimes you know you turn up on location and people are like, you're here for two months to film a flower. That seems absolutely crazy. What are you doing that for? But it's only kind of after, I guess, you know, Joseph sees all the kit, you end up having to look around and all of the very mind-numbingly boring bits of filming that you don't get to see when you watch the show that you realise how long it takes to try and film this stuff. Um, so, yeah, interesting insight, yeah. I guess. Um, I'm actually going to defer this question to Joe because it, it is a conversation that we've had before. Um, it's again from Yolanda. Uh, is there an option for citizen scientists to get involved in growing these conservation collections as, as a collective? Um, and, and Joe, almost what I'm, I'm, I'm wanting is that question that I asked you in terms of uh, as someone who's, who's come into Botsok relatively recently, how did you find... Um, that is actually a space that you could start doing conservation things in, which is complementary to your day job and, and so forth. And you're on mute. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, obviously like one of the best ways is to try and join um, something like crew. So the custodians for rare and endangered wildflowers, that's a, it's a really brilliant group that um goes out and monitors these kind of plants like Serati and Pilgrim um and they do it all over the country so uh, I didn't actually join onto them when I was in the Cape but now that I'm up in Kharteng I'm joined onto the uh, Kharteng branch and they have regular uh, regular meetings where we go out and try and um, monitor these these rare populations of plants and they target these um particularly target these these narrow endemics and the ones that they they, they rank as concerns um, and that's going on all over the country. So I think that's a brilliant place for citizen science to get involved. Um, in terms of growing these uh, in collections, that's a little bit trickier. Um, I think uh, generally the growing goes under uh, kind of strict permits for kind of uh, collections. So uh, I'd recommend either trying to help out at, at uh, either some of the Sandby uh, branches, I think, or some of the Batsak branches, um, or the botanical gardens, I think that's a good place to try and get involved and see if they have any um, 
have any requirement for hands-on deck. Uh, like Rupert was saying, there's so many plants that, that require this kind of um, require this kind of assistance that it's easy for some to fall off. So the more hands-on deck, the better. Um, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, take a look at the take a look at the crew site. I think that's a, a brilliant place to start and get you um, connected with other people that are interested, um, either that are in academic spaces or just interested naturalists and helps bring people together from different backgrounds. So I think it's a good place to, to try and get involved from a citizen science perspective. Yeah, and the interesting thing, of course, uh, and, and you did it too, Joe, is that people don't always see crew as a botsock product, <laughs> which it actually is. You know, um, we're joined at the, at the hip um, and we've been working pretty hard to get crew more involved with our branches as they as they get back on steam post like the hard parts of COVID. And um, so uh, we've had good meetings up in Gauteng and, and Limpopo and a couple of other places. And uh, that collaboration actually leads me into um, the outro, which I'll do shortly, but I'm giving the last opportunity for uh, any chat that, that the two of you wanted to have to each other or to me. Um, and then I'm going to do a little bit of uh, advertising. I have a quick question for Alistair while we have you on the line, yeah. Um, so, so one of my favorite series, Alistair, was the, I think it's called The Secret Life of Plants, which is a BBC show on plants in the, in the 90s. And it was, it was an absolutely brilliant series, which is, I think it almost serves as like a lecture material for first to second year biology students. It was so good. And it's, I mean, I, I just love the fact that Green Palette was coming out. That was part of the excitement when I got the email from Lance, just knowing that um, another another focus on plants is coming out. Um, what I wanted to ask was how much inspiration was drawn from that series? Because there are obviously some really classic stories that kind of have to be told. And now that you guys have different access to equipment and um, different cameras, you can tell these stories in different ways. Uh, how much how much of a balance was there to try and like build on those old stories to um, going out and finding something brand new like the Sierra Carrier story? Mm. That's a really interesting point. And, um, you know, so many so many people have referenced that series as uh something which really sticks in their mind there was um a really iconic bramble time lapse where the 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 bramble is growing along the forest floor as shot in the uk and i know over here so many people who got themselves into the botanical sciences had referenced that as an inspirational kind of moment for them to see that as a young person and so the that series was the inspiration for this. It was 25 years since uh, that series had come out and there, were, there hadn't been a single major series done on plants ever since. Um, so we went into this thinking we're going to make the private life of plants too. Uh, obviously, when you go into this new series, you want, you think 25 years, we've got 25 years of scientific discovery and advancements in technology. So we can film a brand new suite of species until you end up looking at the stories that they filmed. And actually there, there have been stunning revelations in the plant world that would have made incredible um, moments in a film, but to have a story which has a really clear beginning, middle and end and a story arc that you can film, that you have a chance of filming a plant in a studio moving around, um, that you can have good access to, that you can afford to get to in a global pandemic, uh, you you quickly realise that in that first series, they did an amazing job of finding some of the best um, kind of species which opened a door onto, onto that, that kind of um, that field. Because some of them we tried to find alternatives to, but for example, the climbers and the creepers in the UK with the brambles and that kind of stuff, it just demonstrates that challenge that that plant has so well that it's hard to find something to top it. Um, and, you know, other stories which we did include, for example, we did um, in the deserts program, there is a mistletoe species where the, the seed of the mistletoe lands on a cactus and out of it grows this, um, this kind of probing um, root, which then goes inside the cactus. And of course, it, there's just so many stunning things to talk about with that plant, but actually filming what it does is extremely hard. So the decision making for what was included in the show was often what can we realistically visually bring to and also to an audience which is not just plant enthusiasts, it's it's anyone really. 
because if we were making a, a show for plant enthusiasts, we would have included a whole different set of plants, you know, but because you're trying to open it out to a broad audience, it's interesting how well that original series did in, in, you know, finding the examples which would make it accessible for people. Um, so yeah, it's, it was a big inspiration and I hope we managed to move the, you know, the story on, but we, we did find that they did an extraordinarily good job the first time. And then for the real nerds out there, there's also that um, movie, The Secret Life of Plants, which has got a soundtrack by Stevie Wonder, which is yeah. plant themed. So go and look that up <laughs> yeah. on, on your various platforms. Okay, cool. I just want to thank both of you right now for, for this amazing discussion and, and um, opening our, our eyes up again to the cool stuff that plants do and specifically our plants and how we can be proud of them uh, you know, that we can stand on a global stage and be like, our plants are amazing. And um, we just want to be, uh, you know, getting that message out to our members, to the general public, especially to young people that like, they, they, they know that plants are not these static beings, but there's a whole lot going on there if you look closely. So uh, thanks for showing us that again um, and keep an eye out for, for wherever the, um, the, BBC Green Planet is showing and we might be doing a couple of showings um, from Botsock side as well. So uh, keep, keep your eyes peeled. Um, watch our social media uh, channels. And then I've shared the link for the after party Zoom in the chat and it's, it's in your email as well. So um, thanks for that. And I'm just going to do a quick ad break for, um, you know, answering one of those questions of in terms of what can we do? So what we can do is this is where our Botsock branches are located across the country and upcoming um, on the 29th of April um, up to the 2nd of May is the City Nature Challenge, which is an iNaturalist um, challenge. And all these branches are now taking part in the City Nature Challenge. So that's immediately something that you can go and do. We'll uh, again keep an eye on the Botsock social medias. Uh, platforms as we get closer because there will be um, tra training from crew and we'll be talking to uh, international collaborators. Um, there'll be all sorts of planning and so forth going on. And, and no matter where you're based in South Africa, you would be close to one of these uh, projects. So um, that's an immediate thing that we could do. And then um, our next webinar, which is um, the last day of March, is, uh, you know, before people always ask, what can we do? And uh, we've been working pretty hard at uh, Botsock to put together a set of tools for the, the average South African Botsock member to be, you know, this is what you can do. So we've got a, we've worked out um, with a service provider, Luke Verbergt has done a fantastic lecture series on um the EIA process, but specifically from a botanical point of view, because essentially once you get to this stage on, on the screen where your favorite local area has been bulldozed, it's too late. We need to preemptively catch uh, the EIA process um, when it happens. Um, our legislation in South Africa actually has a lot of space for interested and affected parties to get involved in, in helping to shape and improve the EIA, the environmental impact assessment process. Um, so we're actively um, getting you all into that space to be our little citizen scientist army on the ground. And we hope to that you join us on the journey. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to end this session now. We can take a um, five minute body break and then we'll see you in the other Zoom session if you want to have uh, another kind of catch up and ask some questions. I think Joe will be able to join us um, and just stay safe out there and uh, keep loving plants. Cheers and good night.